Hello, it's Tom here, and today we're thinking about everyone's favourite IGCSE topic of the menstrual cycle. Uh, it's a complicated topic, so we are going to look at it very carefully, and we're going to think in particular about how it's controlled by hormones, what those hormones are, which ones we're using, and why the timing is so important. The menstrual cycle is controlled by two endocrine glands, and the two we're interested in are the pituitary gland over here doo -doo 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 -doo, and down here the ovaries. Now the ovaries uh, contain the ova or it's Latin for eggs and it'll be the uh, follicles which contain the ova that we'll be thinking about. The pituitary gland produces two hormones in particular that we're interested in today. That is FSH, oh forgive my handwriting, uh, which is follicle stimulating hormone and LH, which is luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing because it means turns yellow and we'll think about the significance of that a little bit later. Follicle stimulating hormone does exactly what it says. It stimulates a follicle to develop. Those follicles are down here in the ovaries and they contain the ova. The ovaries themselves put out two hormones. They are estrogen and progesterone. In particular, progesterone has a feedback effect onto the pituitary gland. So it kind of all goes around in a circuit. Uh, high levels of progesterone will inhibit uh, the secretion of FSH and LH. So there's a feedback loop there. And all this is to control when this follicle here, this is a follicle inside an ovary, when this follicle here ruptures, ah, kind of bursts open to release the ovum, this being an ovum here. So this is ovulation and we want this follicle to rupture just at the right time so that an ovum is released when the lining of the uterus here is at just the right thickness so that if an ovum is fertilized, when it gets to the uterus, the lining of the uterus called the endometrium is thick enough to receive it and has got a good enough blood supply to supply that developing embryo with all the oxygen and nutrients and so on that it needs. Then later on in the menstrual cycle that endometrium will become even thicker but if there is no pregnancy uh, that lining will be lost. In fact not that way but down here through there in the menses phase as we go back through and back to the start of the menstrual cycle during menstruation. So it's all about timing. This is an image to show us the changing thickness of the uterus lining, the endometrium. Day one of the menstrual cycle is defined as the first day of menstruation, the first day of the shedding of that uterus lining. And you can see here it being broken down and ultimately that will be shed out through the vagina. Then from about, well, day it varies, doesn't it? Um, but from day four to day seven, maybe we'll change into the proliferative phase and then the uterus line will start to get thicker and thicker up till day 14 when ovulation will occur. All, th all these times are approximate and they vary, but then that uterus line gets thicker until around here, at which point, now we're concerned with two hormones here, estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen is the American spelling. Oestrogen, a high level of oestrogen causes the thickening of this uterus lining. So you'll see that when oestrogen peaks around here, as its first peak, you'll see that the uterus lining starts to get thicker. Go from this thickness here to that thickness up there. Then, after ovulation, you will see that oestrogen starts to fall again. There's still a bit of it around, so we still get some thickening. But in particular, progesterone levels then start to rise. And it's this high level of progesterone there which maintains the uterus lining. So oestrogen thickens, progesterone maintains. All this is to ensure that ovulation occurs at the right stage for the lining of the uterus, the endometrium. How is this accomplished? This here is 
a representation of the follicle. And inside the follicle, there is this blue structure here, which is the ovum. And in the presence of FSH from the pituitary gland, this follicle will be stimulated to develop. You can see it getting larger and larger here. Actually, in here, this is a fluid-filled cavity in there. And this follicle, as it develops, will be secreting estrogen. Therefore, you can see that as this follicle develops, the levels of estrogen rise. At ovulation, this remnant of the follicle here, as the ovum is released, becomes what is called the yellow body, or the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum then kind of takes over on the secreting duties, and it secretes progesterone. Therefore, you get this surge in progesterone after ovulation because it's the corpus luteum which is doing the job now. This progesterone has two jobs. One, yes, to maintain the uterus lining, but the other is it will inhibit FSH. You can see here FSH levels, they surge just before ovulation and then they plummet. That's because progesterone now will be pushing those levels down. There's a negative feedback loop on it. So as progesterone rises, FSH and indeed LH goes down. But then as progesterone goes down towards the end of the phase, well, you can see the FSH levels start to go back up again. Progesterone falls here because the corpus luteum itself degenerates. And as it degenerates, it stops releasing so much progesterone until progesterone levels are very low at the end of the menstrual cycle. Well, that takes us back to the beginning again with progesterone low and estrogen pretty low, but FSH rising and stimulating estrogen to rise because, of course, now the follicle is developing again and you get estrogen released from the follicle. And so it goes round. Just one hormone we haven't talked about, that's LH there. LH's job is to surge just before ovulation. Well, in fact, it surges and then you get ovulation about 36 hours later. It stimulates ovulation. OK, that's all very well. So what happens after that? Well, if there's no pregnancy, then you just go around that cycle again and again. But if there is a pregnancy, here we have an oocyte being fertilized by a sperm. So we end up with uh, the original ovum nucleus in there and the sperm nucleus, and then they fuse together here. We've got a fusion of those two nuclei. Each of these carried half the genetic material, one half from father, one half from mother, and they fuse to give a full complement of genetic material that divides. We've got mitosis going on, and we get lots of genetically identical cells going on. Now, this then ends up around day eight or nine with a blastocyst, which if you like is an early stage embryo. And that is going to have this nice thickened lining of the uterus to implant into, so it's gonna have a blood supply and so on. But have a look at what's going on in here. This is the development of an individual follicle becoming larger and then bursting to release the ovum and then becoming the yellow body or corpus luteum as it goes on. Now, of course, this is going to be kicking out progesterone, as we said, and that is going to be maintaining the lining of the uterus, but this won't last forever under normal circumstances. So surely then, once this is disintegrates, we're going to lose our source of progesterone and the lining is going to be lost and hey, our blastocyst, which is implanted down here, that's going to be lost along with the lining. So what's the solution? Well, there are a couple of solutions. Number one, this blastocyst is a little bit clever because what it can do, whoa, it can release a hormone, which you don't need to know, is easy, called HCG. And HCG just delays the breakdown of this corpus luteum here. So it maintains for a little bit longer and it carries on releasing progesterone, maintaining the uterus lining. Also, well, that, that won't last forever. So also what happens is we have a placenta grow. So uh, ultimately this structure here turns into the placenta here. And the placenta itself is an organ of the fetus it's not an organ of the mother, it's an organ of the fetus, and it 
produces progesterone. So you can see in whose interest it is to produce progesterone and maintain that uterus lining. It is primarily in the interest of the fetus. Now, of course, the mother will have lovely feelings towards its fetus and so on. Or, or maybe it won't, I don't know. Uh, who knows what a zebra feels about the foal developing within her. But this fetus has 100% motivation to keep itself there uh, for as long as possible and to keep that supply of nutrients and oxygen strong. So it releases the progesterone to maintain that uterus lining from its own placenta. Here is a summary table for us. I think this will be really useful to get down your notes and it's a good one to memorize. Maybe turn it into a card sort or flip cards, things like that. Well, thanks very much. And I'm going to leave you with a picture which is really complicated, giving you all the feedback loops. Here we go.